<laughs> All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to another segment of Perspective Matters Online Bible Study. Uh, we are dealing with applying the kingdom, rediscovering the priority of God for mankind. And we are literally finishing this, uh, this series some 14 weeks after we began it. And we're going to finish it, I believe, in grand style. Uh, we're going to finish it where we really begin uh, kingdom life at the process of entering the kingdom. The process of entering the kingdom. This is the process of entering the kingdom, part two. We did part one last week, and I pray that your appetite was wet for more. Uh, we even looked at, uh, not only did we look at our own immigration status coming out of being aliens to the kingdom, to flipping the script and being an alien instead to the kingdoms of this world and becoming citizens of the kingdom of God and what that requires of us. And the fact, too, that there's some counterfeit uh, in church. Uh, there's some illegal immigration going on. Folks who are claiming citizenship but having none of it. Uh, we, we are literally watching, the world is watching today uh, with glaring eyes at, as a leader of the quote-unquote free world who claimed uh, a label of Christian and Christianity but is not walking as a citizen. My goodness, I just saw a news clip of our president literally pushing another president out of the way for a photo opportunity. Literally, physically manhandling the, the guy because he's president of a smaller nation. <laughs> what gives you the right to manhandle someone, just push them out of the way so that you can get in the front row for a photo op? Uh, that, that, that's... You, somebody might make an excuse for it being Christian, but it's not citizen. It's not citizenship. That's not what citizens of the kingdom do. So we're going to um, make our citizenship sure, okay? We're going to make our election sure tonight, give you some tools uh, that we all need to make our election sure. Amen. Because one thing, again, that profound statement that Paul made, make your election sure, it um, – it is a profound statement because it declares that, number one, you can't work your way into this thing. You were elected by someone else. And number two, um, the only way it can be sure is if you agree to accept the election that you are elected to, accept the office that you were elected to. Um, God is drafting you, but he's not going to draft you against your will. Your will has got to be in agreement with the offer that he's presenting to you. What was interesting was Jesus was being drafted to become king of Israel. Uh, because of the works that he did, there was a move afoot to literally draft him into kingship. But he refused the induction, if you will, by this a uh, band of, of believers because he his kingdom was not political. His kingdom was bigger than that. And before we go into all of that, let's go into a word of prayer to open up. Father God, we come before you, Lord, on this on this evening, Lord God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. I thank you, Father, for everyone that you've gathered here, Lord God, from the East Coast, the West Coast, the North, the South, the Midwest, oh God. We thank you, Father, for the gathering of believers, and for the gathering even of those who know you not. Lord God, we pray and ask a special blessing on this study tonight that we who know you, O oh God, would indeed make our election sure. And those who aren't sure of their election, Lord God, we pray that you would touch every heart, Lord God, that is left in doubt. Lord God, and those who know that they know that they know that they do not do not have you as Lord and Savior, they have not made you as king, that before the uh, amens are said at the end of this study, that they would gladly and willingly and uh, hysterically give their lives over to you and to claim you as their Lord and Savior and have it be real as they surrender lordship of their lives to you. In the name of Jesus. Now speak with my mouth, think with my mind, 
those truths and things that you would have us to know and apply to our lives that we may indeed, even when tested, be found in the elect, among the elect, and in your kingdom. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, I hope you've got your Bibles out because we're going to need them tonight. Uh, here at Perspective Matters, of course, if you haven't been with us before, we feed and foster a kingdom mindset to enable you to flourish in an ever-fluctuating ever world. Uh, we treat Bible study as an exercise that should be tangible for today and preparatory for tomorrow. As the Apostle Paul uh, wrote, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God, that the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. We are gathered here today. We're training for reigning. That is the purpose why we are gathered around the word of God. And I pray infected and affected by the spirit of God that we might know and understand this word and be fully uh, trained for the roles that God has called us to in his kingdom. And that word and that call is also prophetic. So we take a prophetic stance where Bible study is concerned. We're not studying the past for history's sake. We're studying the past for the kingdom's sake, the kingdom to come. That kingdom is now. That kingdom has arrived. It has not yet fully manifested. But during its manifestation, we are being manifested as well as kingdom citizens and may our training manifests the kingdom and our place and position in it. So we're dealing with the prophetic as we're being prepared as kingdom citizens trained to reign. Amen? Well, applying the kingdom, this has been an awesome study, hasn't it? Uh, applying the kingdom provides important context to living an abundant life through absolute priority for the kingdom of God. Our intention is to share secrets of success through establishing kingdom priorities. And I'll tell you what, you can't get more successful than knowing that you know that you know that you are a kingdom citizen. There is no greater success than entering the kingdom of God. Being a kingdom citizen, being an ambassador, you can't wear a greater title than that. What an awesome uh, privilege it is to be a part of the kingdom of God. Uh, the purpose for our study these last some 14 weeks has been to learn the keys to living a joyful and fulfilled life based on kingdom principles. Uh, I pray that you've had it thoroughly explained how, number one, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but it is life without a purpose. That the greatest challenge in life is not knowing what to do. That the greatest mistake in life is being busy but not effective. That the greatest failure in life is being successful but in the wrong assignment. Yes, applying the kingdom, I pray that it, that it has brought you a new sense of belonging to your spiritual, emotional, and physical life. Apply the kingdom and you'll get the kingdom. Week one, we dealt with our introduction to set the stage. In week two, we talked about first things first. Week three, the danger of misplaced priority. Week four, the exclusiveness of the divine priority. In week five, the divine priority mandate. Week six, the power of righteousness. Week seven, righteous positioning, the key to abundant kingdom living. Week eight, the benefits of righteousness. Week nine, the kingdom key to accessing the things of the kingdom. In week 10, the kingdom principle of addition, part one. Week 11, the kingdom principle of addition, part two. Yeah, that thing got so good, we did a part one and part two to understand that we know that we know that God is about the business of adding to our lives. Amen. Week 12, we discussed service, 
the heart of kingdom culture. And it certainly defies the culture of the kingdoms of this world. Week 13, last week we began to discuss the process of entering the kingdom. The process of entering the kingdom, part one, and that leaves us with today, tonight. Week 14, the process of entering the kingdom, part two. Amen? Well, let's get right on to it. The process of entering the kingdom, part two. How to become a citizen. How to become a kingdom citizen. Well, it says this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Concerning Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. I want to deal with that verse for a moment. You see, you do not talk about a firstborn unless other children are born after him. Uh, yeah, the Apostle Paul is making a seminal statement about our Savior in whose image those who come after him are cast, right? So we who come after him come after the firstborn, right? Another name for Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, is the Word. He is known as the Word. In, in John chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, it, it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So, he who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, has always been and always will be. And it is his image in which we are cast. You see, this word, Jesus Christ, is the one who speaks words of life into each one he calls into his kingdom. He's called the word because he speaks the word. He is the word. He encompasses the word. There's not a word in the word that does not concern him. His coming the first time or his coming the second time. It points to, the word points back to itself. The word points to the word from Genesis to Revelation. So this word is the one who speaks words of life into each one he calls into his kingdom. I pray that every time you hear a brother or sister teaching or preaching the word, they speak words of life into you to buoy you into a life and a lifestyle you have not yet walked in the fullness of as yet, right? It's important that we encourage one another, the Word of God says. You see, you can't earn your way into his good graces nor into his kingdom, all right? This is not a king that you can impress. Kingdom citizenship is not like membership in a social club or civic organization where good work works count as membership points. You know, to join a fraternity or a sorority, you've got to have a certain grade point average, a minimum grade point average. And then during your, uh, to, to, to pass through your indoctrination into that fraternity or sorority, you've got to go through some things. You've got to serve some folks. You've got to earn favor with your brothers and sisters that they would allow you to come in and be a part of their fellowship, but not the kingdom. The kingdom citizenship does not work like membership in a social club or a civic organization where good works count toward membership points. No, just as a new baby can't work their own way into life in this world, you can't work your way into life in God's kingdom. Just like physical birth, you leave behind the confines of your old existence and enter into the endless possibilities of a new life through Jesus Christ. And, and, and I, I love even the way this is, is, is pictured and designed. Uh, you see, physical birth 
You're leaving behind something. You, you leave behind your mother's womb. You leave behind the shaping place where you were shaped and manufactured. And all that's left is a sign that you were once connected to your mother uh, through your umbilical cord. That, that belly button of yours right in the middle of your torso is the only sign that's left behind that you began some place that you had to leave. In that same way, spiritually, we leave behind the confines of our old existence because that wasn't life. Not according to God's perspective. Right? You sucked air, you walked earth, you had the, the bodily and physical requirements of food and water. Um, but that wasn't life according to life as God has ordained it. You were existing, but you weren't living. But we're called out of our old existence and into the endless possibilities of a brand new life in a brand new land, a brand new kingdom, we're called spiritually out of one place. And God will not only bring you spiritually into another, but he will bring you physically and materially into another realm as well. To touch every realm of your life, body, soul, and spirit, your salvation has impact in every area of of your life by design. You see, the difference between your physical birth and your spiritual rebirth is the difference is that this birth is a birth of your spirit, a rebirth of your spirit. Your body cannot be reborn. It, it's already been born once, but your spirit needs to be reborn. The Word of God says this in John chapter 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Flesh is only meant to house that which is spiritual. Your real self, your real identity is not what you look like on the outside, but who you are, your spirit, who dwells on the inside, on the inside. Uh, yes, the process of entering the kingdom. Free at last from the power of death. That, that, that is what the process of entering the kingdom entails. It is freedom from the power of death, where God decided to apply the penalty of sin and death to himself. You see, rebirth means shaking free of death's grip once and for all. And I don't even believe those of us who are legitimate and authentic kingdom citizens uh, always understand and, and are reminded of what our rebirth really means. That we've been shaken free of death's grip, the entirety of death's grip over you once and for all. So what was done once is good for all of your life. And, and so we are no longer under the penalty of death or sin because God doesn't see our sin anymore. Let me go into this. Remember, first and foremost, I, I, I want to declare that from God's perspective, he sees you and I, he sees his entire creation in a before and after picture. Right? What God sees is what he intended and purposed from the beginning. There was no death intended for you and for I. Death was never God's will. And it's not God's will today. Yet, well, pastor, people are dying every day. Yes, they're dying every day, but that doesn't mean that God willed it. That is not a function of God's will. Stop blaming God for people's demise, there was no death in the garden at first. And at the first typifies what God's intentions and will consisted of. God sees a picture in the garden of that is God's will. God's will for you and I is a pre-fall existence that we no longer know. But he wants to reconcile us back to, and he's provided a means for that reconciliation. So the before and after picture 
is that God wants to reconcile you to the before the fall perspective that he had when he created mankind and the earth from the beginning. You see, death was not the result of God's will, nor is it today. Death is the result of Adam's sin. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. We can't forget that, and God is going to honor his word and his promise. His promise was that the wages of sin is death. If you sin, if you disobey me, death is going to be the result. Now, the world is filled with death. Death is the final punishment. But back in the garden, the Father had already set in motion a plan to rescue the very people he created from their own sin. But to accomplish the plan, somebody, not just anybody, but somebody, would have to die. So the only option that was available was a sinless individual would have to come to the earth in the form of a human being to do it, to die. So he asked his sinless firstborn son to do it. Then everyone who would accept the substitution could escape the punishment of death. In other words, God decided to apply the penalty of sin and death to himself because him and the son and the spirit are one. Are one. So Jesus came to earth as a willing, sent substitute to bear our sin and our punishment. You see, in, in Isaiah, it declares uh, from the pen of Isaiah some 700 years before Jesus came to the earth. It was written of him that, um, uh, that he would be beaten so bad that the cross would so disfigure him that he would not be recognized as a person, that he would be so disfigured by the cross that he wouldn't be recognized as a human being in any human form. And I believe that the reason for this wasn't the physical beating that he took, although that was tragic to be sure, beyond our imagination in fact. But even more so than that, it was the tragedy of him bearing the load of the world's sin. Just think about it. Everyone who has ever been born or existed or will exist, Christ himself bore the ugliness of all of our sin, all piled on top of him at one time. That was his disfigurement. That's what relegated him as something less than, than, than even being seen as a human being because God intended glory for humanity. God made us in his image and his likeness. And just think in, a, in one time, in a period and space of six hours, Jesus hung on a cross bearing the sin of the entire world. And I believe that so disfigured him in the eyes of God that he wasn't even seen as even being a representation of what human form looked like because human form was made in the image of God, the image and likeness of God. But sin so disfigured Jesus on the cross that he no longer even represented God's likeness in any way. Ah, what a revelation that is. Think, of, think about that. You know, we think in terms of the physical all the time. Uh, we, we think of the, the beating to a pulp that Jesus received from the Roman guards, but it was worse than that. It was worse than any of us can even imagine. Because the disfigurement cut to his soul. It cut to the very spirit of he himself who wasn't flesh but was spirit, just like you and I. And some of us, don't look like what we've been through. We, Because of our sin condition, we've gone through some things. We've been through some things that only by the grace of God doesn't show on the outside of ourselves. Because it, the, the ugliness of what has cut us up on the inside bears no likeness to our outer man and woman. And, and isn't that just by the grace of God? 
Because, man, if I own, if I look like what I've been through, y'all would cut and run. Who is this ugly, tall up brother up in here? But we can put a mask on. And when we come to Christ, we don't need mass anymore. The mass really become the glory of the living God on us. That covers the ugliness of what we've been through. My God. Mm. So God decided to apply the penalty of sin and death to himself. Jesus came to earth as a willing, sent substitute to bear our sin and our punishment. His bearing of our sin and the death that was meant for us was the ultimate demonstration of this thing that we call love. You want a demonstration of what love looks like? We can't even get an accurate picture of it on, with Jesus on the cross. Because we only see renderings, artist renderings, of his physical condition. The blood that was running down, the, the, uh, the, the nails, the, the spikes in his hands and in his feet. The crown of thorns plunged into his brow. And ultimately the final blow, the spear that was shoved into his side. The lashes that he took on his back, separating skin and muscle from bone, beating him within an inch of his own life even before he was put on the cross. But we have no idea, nor is there an artist's rendering, of the agony of his soul. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you? Why have you forsaken me? I do believe that was Jesus at his at his soul's ugliness. He where he wore the the ugliness of sin upon him, your sin and my sin, and every one of the multiple billions and billions of people who have and will inhabit this earth. What a demonstration of love that is. Even as we say we love someone, would we be willing to suffer the agony that Jesus suffered as a demonstration and show of our love? My goodness. My goodness. Um, that is mind-blowing and, and soul-stirring if there ever was. Free at last from the power of death. You see, Jesus carried to the cross not only our sin, but he also carried its consequences, the consequences of our sin. He, he carried to the cross our evil thoughts. He carried our thought life to, to the cross. He carried our broken hearts to the cross. The brokenness of broken spirits and broken relationships, those consequences that come part and parcel to sin. He carried our diseases to the cross. He carried our injuries to the cross. He carried our disappointments to the cross. He carried our wickedness to the cross. Now the whole Old Testament leads up to the time when Jesus came to do precisely that. From Genesis to Malachi, everything was pointing to, the word was pointing to itself, that it would show up on the scene to extinguish everything that was leaving us broken, leaving us lacking, leaving us missing, that which we need for wholeness. The blood sacrifice system was instilled from the very fall of Adam to the cross of the second Adam. If we see Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 7, if you have your Bibles, um, certainly feel free to, to turn to it. Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse number 3, talking about the implementation of the blood sacrifice system. Verse 3. In the course of time, this is concerning um, Cain and Abel, in the course of time, 
Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn. Is that word again? Firstborn. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. But you must rule over it. Oh, my goodness. There, there's some profound imagery involved in these uh, few verses uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, 3 through 7. Um, the, the first is this. Notice that... Um, in the course of time, by way of process, in other words. You see, there's a process to this salvation thing. That we knew that the need for a Savior and for a salvation and a blood sacrifice happened in the prior chapter, in chapter 3 of Genesis, where we witnessed the first Adam falling. Now we witness his offspring, his progeny, one with a fallen face because his sacrifice uh, God had no regard for. Why didn't God have a regard for Cain sacrifice. Why? Because there was no blood attached to it. The reason why Cain sacrifice was accepted was because not only was it a blood sacrifice, but also Abel knew something about a coming Savior. There was something that God had put into Abel uh, that he elected him to have some knowledge of something beyond Abel's own self that he would understand what a savior would accept as a reasonable sacrifice. The firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions is what he brought before the Lord. There was something innate in Abel that allowed him to know and be able to discern what was acceptable to the Savior versus anything less than that. Now, the fact is that they both brought sacrifices, but one was more acceptable than the other. One contained blood. And the other was just a fruit of the ground. You see, the killing of an innocent animal as a sacrifice, though, is not the same as killing an innocent man. What was required to cure our sin condition uh, was something greater than just the sacrifice of an animal. Now, this animal's blood sacrifice system lasted a mighty long time from Genesis chapter 4 all the way until the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, the New Testament. The penalty for sin, understand this, was not on animals. It was on humans. So God needed a sinless human sacrifice to serve as the ultimate payment for sin. Everything else in the Old Testament blood sacrifice system was pointing to the word who was to come. That word, Jesus Christ, who became our blood sacrifice and the only atonement we would ever need. Thus, even Jews can't explain it, but after Jesus went to the cross, somehow, some way, the blood sacrifice system ended. And no one can really explain why. But God. All of a sudden, what was extinguished at Calvary was any blood atonement system that had been needed before him. Because the ultimate sacrifice had come and he was sacrificed. Jesus was that sacrifice. Now, check this. If we accept what Jesus did, 
the words of Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 8 can apply to our own lives. Uh, well, uh, Pastor, what, what word is this out of Romans chapter 6? Well, be a good Berean and turn the pages of your Bible with me. And let's see what the word says that if we accept what Jesus did, what will apply to our own lives? Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. And it reads, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we had been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, understand that when you're, when you're set free from sin, you're also set free from sin's consequences. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sin comes with consequences, the ultimate consequence being death. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You aren't just redeemed. Ultimately, you and I are redeemed from death when we accept the sacrifice that Jesus made. But we're also... If we're, if we're now redeemed from and released from the ultimate penalty of sin, which is death, you're also released from the penalties of disease, of brokenheartedness, of poverty, all of the things that, the conditions that sin causes. If you're released from the ultimate penalty of sin, aren't you, doesn't it make sense that you're reduced from some of the lesser stuff? Some of the lesser stuff, in fact, brings us to death. It brings us to the death of our peace. It brings us to the death of our understanding because we get so caught up in the worry about things that we've been redeemed from. We need to fully accept and embrace our salvation because if we do, that also releases us from the condition and consequence of worry. That's why we're called not to worry about anything. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Claim your redemption. Redemption from sin. Free at last from the power of death. You see, once Jesus died, nobody else had to die. You don't have to die if you fully accept and embrace his sacrifice. Well, uh, well, Pastor, doesn't it say... Um, uh, that uh, all must die once? Well, we've got to look at death again, not from our human perspective, which is limited, but from God's perspective. God calls us to see death as he sees it. He sees death the way that he has, uh, has restored and engineered those who are redeemed as not death at all but a passageway to a brand new beginning. We see death as an ending. But for the redeemed of the Lord, it's a brand new day. It's a brand new beginning. I'm going to tell you all right now. I'm going to put it out there. Uh, if, if or when the Lord should ever call me home, don't y'all don't y'all have no grief party for me. Y'all better have a praise party for me. Because I will sure be laughing <laughs> from where the venture point that the vantage point that I'll have from on high. Uh, don't be brokenhearted over my departure, not demise. When we de when we depart, saints, we depart. It is not our demise. It is merely our departure into the fullness of a kingdom that we've been talking about preaching about, teaching about, studying about, longing for. Once Jesus died, nobody else had to die. His death paid for all that sin. He made it possible for us to be born 
anew. Now through Jesus, eternal life has been restored. I'm talking about a pre-fall garden experience is there for us to experience because Jesus restored what the Father had always purposed and intended, that we would live and not die because sin would not apply. We can live forever as if we never sinned even once. That is the benefit of citizenship. We've got papers to show and they are written in the blood of Jesus. We are blood bought into the kingdom. That he doesn't see our sin, he sees our passport and gives us a pass because the spirit of death passes over because of the blood. You've got a passport. And that passport, written in the blood of Jesus, is promised to everyone who believes, is your passport in the kingdom and causes the death angel to pass over you, just as it did the children of Israel who obeyed the, the voice of the Lord and put the blood of an innocent lamb over their doorposts. This is the salvation story. If you want to make it your own story, you need to be born again spiritually. Just as both water and blood were involved in natural childbirth, both water and blood were part of Christ's death. Let's look at, the, at John. John chapter 19, verse, uh, verse 34. John 19, 34. Speaking of water and blood, 1934, and it reads, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. You see, just as blood and water are shed during natural childbirth, the birth that Jesus allowed us to partake in, a rebirth, came by way of the same substance. But it was his, the shedding of his blood and his water that allows us to be reborn spiritually into brand new life. And they signify the life of every, every believer. The, the new life is signified by water and by blood. Let's look at... Um, Let's go from the Gospel of John to an epistle of John, the first epistle of John. John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 8. Let's look and see how this blood, water and blood are part of not only Christ's death, but your rebirth and my rebirth. John chapter, 1 John chapter 5. Uh, beginning at verse 4. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there, is, for there are three that testify. Listen. The Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. Mm -mm -mm. For those of us who meet uh, every week on Wednesday for the uh, Perspective Matters prayer call, whether at 6 a.m. Eastern Time or 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time or both. Uh, we know something about the power of agreement. And the power of agreement, what makes the powerful power of agreement powerful is not just us agreeing with one another, but the blood and the water that Jesus Christ shed on the cross that we agree with it shedding and what it means for us and the authority that it gives us to turn a bad circumstance around and have the Lord 
bring good out of it. The power of his blood, the washing of water that washes our sins away, the water and the blood. Uh, this demonstration of immersion, uh, baptism, ba to be baptized simply means to be immersed. We are literally immersed in both the water and the blood of Jesus to the point that he doesn't see us as sinners anymore. Not when we are immersed, not by ritual, but by right, by birthright. Uh -huh. To meet somebody is not to know their birth. You don't know their birthright. You don't know their birth order. You don't know what they have nor what their inheritance is, not unless they tell you. In the same way, you could see someone be baptized, but their baptism will be a lifestyle. It will become how they live. They will be immersed in the water and the blood of Jesus, and they will understand that that immersion signifies something. It, it is not just a, some kind of religious experience. No, it is not that. It becomes a lifestyle that is anything but religious. It is not about rituals. It is, it is about life itself. Amen? The process of entering the kingdom. Born into citizenship. That is what we are. I love this in John chapter 3, verse 3. We have the account of Jesus encountering the Pharisee, the ruler of the synagogue in Jerusalem, the powerful Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is a definitive statement and a definition of, of kingdom citizenship. Most assuredly, Jesus says, uh, truly, truly, verily, verily, it, it, most assuredly, it, I'm not telling no lies. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot be born for your children, and you can't be reborn for them either. Just because their parents are in the kingdom of God does not automatically put them in. We've got to understand that you've got to be born into this thing. You can't work into this thing. Somebody just can't hand you a baton and you get into this thing because you are connected to thus and so and whosoever. No, you've got to know this for yourself. You've got to be born again yourself. You've got to be reborn yourself. Now, Nicodemus is a prime example out of John chapter 3, this, this uh, encounter that he has with Jesus. Nicodemus, a religious leader, the, the ruler of the synagogue, he was the top dog in the most religious place in all of Israel. In the synagogue, in, in the temple, Nicodemus, a religious leader, when he met Jesus, he knew upon meeting him that he needed something more than the religion he had. Let's look at, at uh, John chapter 3, beginning at verse 3. John 3, 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, or most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, or most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, 
Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Uh, Jesus put them on blast. Jesus put his religion on blast. Jesus put his religious doctrine and knowledge on blast. This learned man, th remember this man is a Pharisee. From the time he could talk, he was indoctrinated into the law. The first five books of the Bible, what was required of him. By the time he turned 13 and was bar mitzvahed, he had to be able to memorize and quote word for word every word of the first five books of the Bible. Some of us have, uh, have trouble with Jesus wept. <laughs> the Pharisees had to memorize, to become a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible verbatim. Not five scriptures, not five verses. No, I'm talking about five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You had to have it down. This man who knew so much, along with his other pharisaical brethren, did not know what kingdom citizenship required. He was a religious leader, but upon meeting the king, he realized that his knowledge was nowhere near enough. He needed something more than just religion. So Jesus told Nicodemus that the only way to get into the country of the kingdom is the same way he could only get into the nation of Israel, through birth. He had to be born into Israel to be considered an Israelite. Uh, the Gentiles, if you weren't born into this thing, you couldn't even get into the inner court. Uh, there was a court for you. It was on the outside. It was called the court of the Gentiles. It was on the very outskirts of the, of the synagogue, of, of the temple. Right? Even the women got closer than Gentiles did, and, and women were considered at the time, uh, kind of outside of being in the know. Because most women at that time couldn't read. It was the men who were learned. And, and, and typically the learned men tended to be those who were involved in religious service, like the Pharisees. Right? Everyone else was marginalized. And who was marginalizing people? The learned people, the religious people. And religious people are still marginalized, marginalizing others today, marginalizing people right outside of the kingdom when they themselves aren't even in the kingdom. The Pharisees weren't in the kingdom. They didn't know the king. So Jesus explained to him that his body, Nicodemus' body, was not him. It was not what, what uh, needed uh, – that needed to be transformed. It wasn't him physically. His spirit was. His spirit was the real him. His spirit needed to be reborn. It wasn't necessary for his physical body to go back inside of his mother's physical womb. His spirit needed to be cocooned and changed. You see, his body was just a house for his spirit. His body had already been born. Now it was his spirit's turn. You cannot work for kingdom citizenship, nor win the king's favor. This was the central question of Nicodemus's understanding about salvation and kingdom citizenship. He thought he could work his way in. He thought by being a high official, it, it was a foregone conclusion that he had the favor of God, that he would be in the kingdom. But nope, he was just put on blast. You must be born anew in your spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. The process of entering the kingdom, being born into citizenship. Until you're born again, you cannot experience the kingdom personally. The Word of God says this uh, itself. It says, unless, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Now, this word for see in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Greek actually means to experience, 
to see the kingdom, to experience the kingdom, you must be born again and be born again personally to personally experience the kingdom and the presence and power of the king. You see, being born again is not a religious experience. People today in church are looking for churchy experiences, even what they might classify as spiritual experiences. Uh, people today are swearing off certain belief systems and now just labeling themselves spiritual. They want a spiritual experience, which really ultimately just becomes an emotional experience. People get caught up in emotions at church, and it seems like religious leaders know exactly how to stoke the fires of human emotion, get you all jacked up and, and hyped emotionally, only when you need the experience of the king and the kingdom to make a difference in your life. All of the emotion in the world can't bring and match the experience of the living God flowing in your life. A one-time experience of uh, getting high emotionally in a sanctuary will do very little for you when you need to experience God's glory in the midst of troubling and difficult circumstances. Being born again is not a religious experience. It is a process, a pathway. You see, this encounter with Nicodemus is the only time in the Bible that Jesus mentioned being born again. It, it gets no mention after this. Not that being born again uh, is not important or is being downplayed by Jesus. No, it isn't. He went into a thorough discussion of it and used a religious leader as the point man to bring our understanding to bear as to what salvation really is, all right? That here is a religious leader, top dog of all the dogs, didn't have it. So religion, obviously, nor can Bible knowledge itself bring you into the kingdom. You see, most of the time, uh, Jesus didn't preach being born again. He simply preaches that the kingdom is here now. The kingdom has arrived now. New birth or being born again is the avenue to citizenship in the kingdom he's preaching about. He's saying, here's your way to it, but I want to preach what you're into, what you're going into, and what I've, I've put you into as my kingdom citizen. Once you're there, that's where the journey really begins. You see, uh, many of us have this before and after picture of our salvation. Where there, was, there was our lives, our, our existence before we were saved, and then there's our lives after we were saved. But it is all about that journey of the point of our salvation to our glorification in which we're really caught up in the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom gets us caught up in. See, this new birth is merely an avenue to citizenship in it. Now, how would Nicodemus know that he had been reborn? Well, the same way that you and I know, because we have the spirit of Jesus, the king, inside our spirits. They are uh, tabernacling together inside of your heart. Now, not, not just the concept of a, your, your physical heart that beats. No, no, no. It, it's your inner core, your inner self. You, your body is a physical tabernacle that houses your spirit in fellowship with the Holy Spirit together. Together. You're in it together. You're in it together, and you're both in it to win it. You see, John answered that question this way. And let's turn back again to 1 John chapter 4. Very, very important scripture. Very important scripture that you get this. 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse uh, 13. Beginning at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and 
abides and it got, God abides in him. Let me, let me restate that, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. To confess Jesus as God, to confess him as the Lord, also confesses our salvation. That we believe that we believe that he himself is God. That he abides in God and the Father and the Father abides in him. That's the one who is saved. You have, it takes the spirit of the living God to acknowledge the deity of Jesus Christ. That's what made Peter uh, an important part in the founding of, of the church, where Jesus said, who do you, who do you say that I am? I, I hear you telling me what other people, uh, who other people think that I am. Who do you, you walk with me every day. You've been walking with me every day for three and a half years. Who do you say that I am? And Peter boldly proclaimed, as only, as, as only he could, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus confessed, it was the Spirit of God. Your flesh didn't tell you that. It, it was the Spirit of God in you that gave you that kind of discernment. Just as it was the Spirit of the living God that gave Abel discernment to tell him what sacrifice would be acceptable. There was no law written. No one had written as to what was required as a sacrifice that would be regarded by God. But Abel knew it because he had the Spirit of God living in him. Cain missed it because he, he felt compelled to sacrifice, but his sacrifice wasn't enough. That kind of separates church folk from kingdom folk. Church folk are sacrificing all the wrong things. But kingdom folk recognize all that was required was blood that was already shed. We've got no reason to um, be ritualistic, habitual towards anything. Um, there are no, if you will, um, hard, fast rules to follow. We know that God isn't caught up in Sabbaths because to the kingdom citizen, every day is the Sabbath. He's not caught up in the tithes because everything we have is an offering that we give back to the Lord willingly. We're not caught up in the law as the law was that the Pharisees embraced. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law in himself. And by his blood, the law is fulfilled in us as well. And God does not see us as sinners. He sees us as redeemed and freed. All right? So, by virtue of the fact of not only what we confess, but what we confess should also be what we live. If, if he is indeed who we say he is, God, son of, son of the living God, he is the Lord then would not we obey him? Would not our lifestyles then demonstrate what our mouths are confessing? You see, when you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven's colony on earth, the king sends his governor, the Holy Spirit, to come and live in you, and that begins to make all of the difference in you. Your body becomes the governor's mansion. You see, when sin no longer comes with ease, you know that you're reborn because the spirit will trouble you enough when sin begins to prey upon you and you begin to even think about plotting a, a sinful thing the Holy Spirit will begin to whisper and trouble your spirit enough to say no that's not right I, I can't do that I, I can't live like that anymore I, I, I used to be able to do that with ease I can't do that anymore I can't just lay down and let sin have its way. Not after what my Christ has put himself through to get me to a place of his righteousness. I don't want to sully his testimony. Mm. 
You see, your change is not physical. Your change of citizenship changes your disposition. Yeah, you become p positioned differently where sin is concerned. Uh, it is just not an easy thing for you to stay and waddle around in a pigsty when you've known you've been called to live in a mansion. You know that you've been called to live on a higher plane than where your sin tends to put you. Uh, we want to think about our lifestyles. Yes, your lifestyle will reveal your change of disposition. Mm. Process of entering the kingdom. Obedience to the law, the key to privileges, the key to kingdom privileges. After your rebirth, you learn how to be a citizen of this kingdom by obeying the laws of the land. You see, we're, it's not about adhering to Old Testament law. But it is knowing the law that makes you a citizen. It is about knowing the ground rules and knowing then because the laws reveal the heart of the king who made the laws. The law was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So if it's been fulfilled in him, then we would do whatever it takes to make the king fulfilled in us and us fulfilled in the king. So, the Bible is the constitution of the country, of the kingdom of God, and the Holy Spirit helps you understand what it says and apply it. The Holy Spirit will also help you understand how the kingdom works. And we continue to get revelation. You will never get so high in your understanding of God, understanding of the king and his kingdom, that you, that you don't have any more learning to do. It amazes me. It, it dwarfs my own understanding. Every time I come into some new revelation, revelatory knowledge of the king and his kingdom, I'm amazed at what I don't know. Yeah, it, I'm not impressed with what I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm really impressed with what I don't know. <laughs> How much more is there, God, that, that you want to reveal to me? There's so much more to understand. And that new understanding just takes us into higher heights and a deepening relationship with him. And we experience the king and his kingdom as he reveals himself to us. His king, his kingship, his kingdom, and how it works. You see, with him living inside you, you'll be able to discern even the difference between true citizens and those who are pretending to be citizens of the kingdom. It's not about judging. It's about discernment. The Holy Spirit says it, the promise of the Holy Spirit, coming from the lips of the Lord himself. He's sending the Spirit. He's sending the Holy Spirit. He said, who will lead you into all the truth. Not just all truth, all the truth. Considering then that truth is narrow. Truth is a narrow subject. There's the truth and then there's everything else. So that people who call you narrow minded, that, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. That's exactly what I am, because narrow is the way that leads to life. There aren't multiple ways that lead into the kingdom. There's only one way. And Jesus Christ is the way, the only way. So that way is narrow and it leads to life. Wide is the road that leads to death and to destruction. So get on that narrow road and don't make any apologies for it. Yep, this is what the king says. This is what I believe, and that settles it. Call me narrow-minded if you want, but you're also going to call me a kingdom citizen. Mm -hmm. Obedience to his constitution and commands is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't walk this walk without him. That's why Jesus proclaimed that every tree, you will know every tree by its fruit. The fruit of the Spirit will reveal a person's true citizenship, whether they are genuine kingdom citizens or whether, whether they're perpetrating a fraud and engaging in illegal immigration. If they're an illegal alien, it'll show up in their lifestyle. It'll show up in their fruit. If you got rotten fruit, then that will identify you as an illegal immigrant. But if your fruit is good and getting better, ah, that's going to identify you as an authentic citizen of the kingdom 
of God. The stuff that I did, I can't do anymore. When you can say that, and you begin to produce a track record that shows that, you're on your way to the kingdom. God isn't finished with me yet. God isn't finished with you yet. But we can only, to, on, to get him started, the only way to get him started on you is to allow him to come in and reign as Lord. You see, God does not leave it up to you to select from a buffet of beliefs and doctrines. Yep, as I stated before, narrow is the way that leads to life. And he has laid that out for us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, and again in Luke 13, 24. Luke 13, 24. Let me just, just reiterate what the Lord is saying here. 13, 24 in Luke. Narrow is the way that leads to life. 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door. We're talking about entering into the kingdom. That door is narrow. For many, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking and teaching. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Wow. It's tight, but it's right. I don't know where you come, came from. Uh, like he was teaching Nicodemus about the spirit. Like a wind, you don't know where it began and you don't know where it's going. But for kingdom citizens, we don't know our genesis and our beginning. All of us have had a different walk. But I'll tell you what. The Spirit is leading you and taking you somewhere once he has command over you. And where he's taking you is a glorious place. How he's going to get you and transport you there? Oh, ho, ho. the journey is really the story. But don't abandon the process because there is a process to entering the kingdom. Kingdom life is meant to be joy-filled, stress-free, and a whole lot more. And I can't find it in me why any of us who know that we know that we're kingdom citizens and that we're, we're headed for the kingdom, how does that not produce joy in us? How does that not minimize and reduce and eliminate every drop of stress? that might otherwise press against us. Look, kingdom life is meant to be joy-filled, yes, stress-free, yes, and a lot more. Is that the kind of folk we find in church today? Uh, mm. I find a lot of people pent up in their own religiosity and legalism. I find a whole lot of people stressed out because they're trying to fake it till they make it. I see a whole lot of people Stress because of the lack that they have in their own physical and material selves. Whereas kingdom life is meant to be lived with this promise. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Now, now that's a stress reliever right there. That's something that should get your feet tapping. And produce some joy in your life because it is a definitive declaration by God himself that he shall supply all your need. This is not a heavenly um, uh, indoctrination. This is not about heaven or when we all get to heaven. No, no, this is about right here, right now. Your need is for now. I don't know about you. I got some need that are present and knocking right now. That's what this word is for, because all needs are suspended in heaven. <laughs> there is no need. Everything, <laughs> the fullness of your salvation is manifested there. You have no physical need, because you, you won't be a physical person in heaven. You'll be living in a glorified body, but while we're still living in this flesh, 
Uh, that flesh produces some needs that are going to have your head banging up against the wall unless you get some relief. Let me give you your stress reliever. This is better than an ibuprofen, better than a Tylenol. It is the presence and the power of the living God in your life to manifest the supply of everything that you need. My goodness, my goodness. The process of entering the kingdom. We're going to finish it on this. It requires a turnaround. It requires you turning around. Repentance. Uh, I like to call it the art and science of the turnaround. Many of us who've been in business may have studied business uh, in school and uh, continue to study business even af after school and there are some books that must be a part of every real business person's library. And there are books on the art and science of management and business management and marketing and all kinds of business subjects. But there is an art and science of the turnaround. Uh, good business managers know something about turning around bad businesses. There are some business managers who are known for being turnaround experts, being able to be inserted in the seat of CEO and taking a, a company company that has lost its way and it may be on its last leg and being able to turn it around. Well, repentance is the art and science of the turnaround. And Jesus makes it uh, very easy, but the devil will make it very hard. Jesus began his, uh, his earthly ministry with this seminal statement, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He announced his kingdom and the way to get there in one fell swoop. One sentence, a one sentence uh, salvation. Yeah, one sentence. Repent. Uh -huh. the, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here, y'all. And the only way to get in is to repent, is to turn around. Turn around your thinking. Turn around your, your, uh, your lifestyle. Knowing that you can't do that by yourself, it's going to take the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. So before even receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, before even receiving the full presence of the Holy Spirit, those who are the elect of God have already, because they've been elected, God has put something in you that will respond to the gospel of the kingdom. You might put it off, you might put it off, but as long as he keeps knocking, sooner or later he's going to wear you down. And here you come, through circumstance, trial, or whatever, you'll finally get it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is required for entry into the kingdom of heaven. All right, To get this, this kingdom life, You've got to repent, first and foremost. Then once you repent, the Lord will begin to turn things around in his strength, not in yours. Lay down your strength, lay down your will, and allow his will to take over. And you'll be on your way to seeing the art and science of the turnaround manifested by the dunamis, the, the supernatural power of the living God working inside you and all around you. And in that, claim your citizenship. Claim your citizenship and reclaim all that was part and parcel of life as God had originally intended and purposed. This is not a membership. Citizenship is not a membership. Remember, you can't work your way into this thing called the kingdom of God. It's not something you could pay for. There's not enough tithes or offerings you can give to God to pave your entree into his kingdom. It can't be bought. He who owns it all is not impressed with what you give to try to win and curry his favor. You see, membership, you must go from membership, that old idea of church membership, to citizenship. Uh, hey, how many services have you been in? I've, I've been to many a Baptist church and other churches as well. I'm not knocking Baptists at all. Um, but these church traditions where uh, the word has been preached and the choir has sung and the conclusion of every service begins with the right hand of fellowship. And the church doors are open. 
Well, you know what? It's not the church doors that we need open and to enter. It's the kingdom that doors that we need open and entered. We need entree into the kingdom. We got too many folks entering church that aren't anywhere near to entering the kingdom. Membership to citizenship. That was illustrated perhaps best by the prodigal son who was in there. He was living high on the hog till he decided to take control of his own destiny. Living high on the hog wasn't good enough. He had to go live with the hogs. And until he was bathed in the muck and the mire of a pig's pen, did he realize and remember where he was prodded to come back to himself. In his own mind and thinking, he came to himself, the word says. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. Only after being in the pigsty and going off on his own way, leaving the kingdom of his father and his father's house, did he know the degradation, the poverty, the slime and the shame of life without his father and the riches of his father that was beyond money. But it, there was citizenship at home. And he left citizenship for membership in a club of fools, indulging in pleasures, only to finally come to himself when he remembered being high on the hog rather than living down in the muck and the mire with the hogs. No place for a good Jewish boy to be. So he went back home with his tail tucked between his legs, his, 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 his pride pummeled to a pulp. No pride left in him. Everybody had knew that he had taken his inheritance early and had flew the coop. And now he was coming back in shame, humbled and humiliated by his choices and by, by what life had, had placed him, life on his own. But there was his father who ran out to greet him and told his servants to put the family signet ring on him, go and clean him up and put on a new robe. You see, every family that uh, was a family of stature had their own crest, their own signet ring. And on his finger went the ring of his father that sealed him, not to membership in some club or society, but sealed him as a citizen of the land he once left, he was warmly welcomed back to. And given his rightful position back, even though he didn't want it back, he, he, he didn't feel worthy to have his place restored. Yet his father replaced him back to his rightful place, not as a servant or a slave, but as a son of the father of that estate. In that same way, the Lord is welcoming you and I back to a kingdom that we've deserted from the beginning. And after getting tired of living with the, the hogs, living with the pigs, God is welcoming us to live not in a hog's heaven, but in his heaven. <laughs> heaven right here on earth. As we colonize this earth for the benefit of his kingdom in heaven, surrender to the offer. Surrender to the offer. He's welcoming you back to a land that we left and was left for us courtesy of the first Adam. But the second Adam made it possible for us to return and be received as sons and as daughters. No longer prodigal, but saved. Uh, this word for prodigal actually means, in the Greek it means generous. Generous. Um, Generous. God is, God's generosity given to those who don't deserve it. Yeah, this, this prodigal son was given a generous opportunity for a rebirth back from the land and the kingdom he left. 
back into the kingdom and warmly received by his Father. That is our salvation story. Though you did not know life before the fall, God is beckoning you back to a restoration of the garden experience that we will know in his kingdom. Amen? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good account? Well, meet us every Tuesday night for one hour Mantle Matters webinar where we're dealing with faith and finances. This kingdom life is not only concerned with just your spirit alone, but God is also concerned about your finances, your health, your relationships. So here in Perspective Matters, we want to reach out, and as God leads, we want to uh, speak to every area and facet of your life and being. On Wednesday, Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, and again at 6 a.m. Pacific time, we've got Perspective Matters prayer calls. These are powerful times where we come together as believers and stand in the gap for one another, for our nation, for our world, for our households, and powerful healings and deliverance are being done right in our midst every week. There are just fabulous testimonies as to what God is doing through the power of of agreement and every Thursday right here 9 p.m. Eastern 8 Central 6 p.m. Pacific time Pacific uh, perspective matters online Bible study what well, it has been a pleasure uh, uh, bringing the word to you and, and going through the uh, applying the kingdom series we pray that it's been a blessing for you if you missed any segment of it we've got all 14 including this one will be posted on our website uh, shortly uh, you can go to our website at perspectivematters.org and catch up on all that you've missed not only in this series but in the series prior to this one and uh, if God wills all the series to come uh, you'll never have to miss a thing uh, Check out our blogs and all that the Lord is doing in our midst to minister to people around the globe. We can't do it without you. I pray that you would keep me, Pastor Philip Lowe, and Perspective Matters Ministries in your prayers as well as in your thoughts. Uh, support us as we seek to support the kingdom and kingdom citizens. Amen. Uh, you can reach us, and we look forward to hearing from you, whether it be through email or online. We look forward to ministering with you and fellowshipping with you. To God be all the glory. Let's pray out. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this time together. We thank you, Lord God, that you have purpose, Lord God, that we would be saved even before the foundation of the world. Oh God, you prepared a plan to restore what our sin lost for us. Oh God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that, that those who whom you have elected, Father, if we just surrender ourselves to our election, Lord God, you've got an office that you've prepared for us as part of part and parcel to your royal uh, uh, priesthood, oh God. You have proclaimed us as little kings and little lords, Lord God, under your divine lordship. Father, we accept our calling as landlords, as uh, stewards of your kingdom right here on this earth. We thank you for the ability that you give us, O oh God, that is supernatural, not of our own strength, just as our righteousness is not ours but yours. Thank you, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that those who don't know you in the fullness of their salvation will Lord God, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And those who are not yet uh, kingdom citizens, I pray, Lord God, that they would join and agree with this prayer today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your kingship. Thank you for your kingdom. I thank you that you have knocked on the door of my heart, Lord God, and here I am. I am responding. I, I come before you, Lord God, and I confess my faults and my sin. I repent right now of everything that I've done contrary to your kingdom rule, Lord God, upon this earth and heaven. Lord God, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all of my unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, come into my life and reign and rule as my Lord and my Savior. For I proclaim you as the living and true God. And by, by you and through you is the only way to my salvation. And I accept all the sacrifice that you've made on my behalf. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be a kingdom citizen. 
Lord, now rule and reign in me that I might receive not only the benefits of kingdom citizenship, but that I might be used of you as an ambassador of your kingdom on the earth for your honor, for your glory, and for my greater good. These things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome into the kingdom. God bless you. Know that I love you in the Lord. Go in peace, and we'll see you next week. God bless.